really important to me. It's taken me months to put it together. I, actually, every day I look at it, I change it because there's so many things happening. Uh, as Stephen mentioned, for four decades, while we had differences with China, we got along and everybody benefited. But then suddenly, suddenly, last year, Vice President, our Vice President had a, a meeting uh, in Washington, D.C. He started talking nasty things about China. And right after he spoke, the President and Secretary of State echoed their very ominous words threatening China. And uh, you probably recall that uh, after that, the director of FBI said that the Chinese were a great threat to us. And so this has actually changed the whole uh, attitude of the country. A year ago in February, everybody thought the Chinese were modest, were competitors. Now they're considered rivals. And so that's changing. That, that went from about 45% in February of February uh, 2017. Poll again in, in the 18. Yeah, 70% saw China as a rival or potential competitor, uh, wartime competitor. So this, these are things that are suddenly happening that are very important for everybody. Following that, you see that what you heard that the chief of staff, the Joint Chief of Joe Stafford, declared that problem, China problem poses the greatest threat to our nation by 2025. That's not and then the thing, the scariest thing, was that the U.S. Trade Representative, who's their lighthouser, stated that China was an existential threat to America. Now that's really, that's really war, war, war talk. If somebody's an existential threat to you, you're going to kill them before they kill you, right? These are things we're putting up with. No. I jumped ahead of myself. I mentioned the. These were their words of war. In the second paragraph here, in June of 2019, a report published by Diplomat reviewed that between February 18 and 19, the attitude of Americans changed from mostly rivals to rivals, which reflected the changing attitudes and intentions of our national interests. However, most of the public still do not view trade imbalance as a critical threat to the United States. And uh, we're going to speak about the trip. trade balance in a second. Here's the next graphic that showed you. But uh, one of the biggest things that uh, everybody complains about is we have this great trade deficit, right? Last year it was $540 billion importing, exporting was only 120. And so when you first look at that, it sounds like it's the end of the world. But is it? Here's a quote from uh, Joseph Nye, uh, who was a Professor Harvard and also former Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Many American businesses and many politicians, including Democrats, felt that China had not been fair in trade, that was giving subsidies to state-owned enterprises, and that it was coercing intellectual property transfer and dumping excess capacity. So you have all this negative stuff, comments. I, I suspect some of it is true, but a lot of it is exaggeration. And now I want to spend some time on something that's really, I think, is really important that nobody talks about. As we noted, in 2018, our imbalance was $539.5 billion. That's a lot of money. Looking at the last six years, you can see that even though it was, it was less every year, even in 2012, it was still $456.6 billion deficit. That, that was hurt. Who does that hurt? This is a little hard to see, but I, would, I took a Perhaps I'm the only person who looked at the contribution of taxes generated with the imbalance. As you know, imbalance is how much the goods are worth when they reach our docks, right? So if, some, if you are a businessman, you pay $100 for a product from China. When you get this product, you're going to sell it, right? You have to mark it up. You're not going to sell it for what you pay for. So there's a 40% markup on everything that comes in before it's sales. iPhones, for example, are marked up 60%. Most quality shoes and clothing are marked up 50%. So I'm conservatively look at 40% markup here. Look at 2018. It's marked up to 75.3 billion. What happens when those goods are sold? When you buy things in store, don't you pay tax? 10%, right? So all these goods that are coming in off the docks and marked up. Uncle Sugar collects 
in 2018 collected $75.53 billion in taxes. This is great because this was money that nobody's invested or taken any risk on. You as a business collect all this money and then ship it to the at the end of the year give it to the federal government. At the state level, that is 5%, that would be roughly half of the 75.3 billion. And so the states last year collected $37.76 billion in taxes. <coughs> and lastly, the cities, the local taxes, collect 2%. That's, that, that's another $15 billion that nobody had to make an investment on. The total for that year was $128.39 billion. That's just one year. This is money that we pay, it goes to the government, and everybody benefits. Because when, they, when the government collects that money, that, that amount of money, the government never has enough money, right? When they collect that money, they don't have to come back to us for it. I did this for six years. And you can see, each year it was a little bit less, but at the end there, after you total the, the six years of total of over $100 million a year, by 2012, the six years of total taxes collected, to the governments was $782.85 billion. Did anybody tell you that? Is that a bad deal? And actually, the total is actually over 33 quarters of a trillion dollars of money that went to our, our governments to help, to help pay for everything we do. The three big things it pays for, defense, social security, and Medicare. If we didn't have this large number of money, Medicare reimbursements would be less because where would the money come, come from? Nobody's ever talked to, to us about that. But that if, if we stop trading, we cut off the, 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 the import stuff, the government, all the governments would lose almost over three and a quarter of a trillion dollars. Does anybody, is that my misleading anybody's logic here? Does that make sense? We all pay taxes, right? Every time we spend money, 10%, 5%, 2%. Well, we, we mentioned that there's a lot of negative talk, almost more talk with China. I guess uh, some of you have probably heard of uh, Professor Graham Allison. He wrote the book Destined for War. And in that book, he made a lot of very important points. The main thing he, he his research revealed, he looked at 500 years of history where there was a competition between a rising power against a dominant power. Those 16 instances that he looked at, 12 times it, it resulted in war. And what Graham is doing is he is trying to warn people that this dynamic of the US and China now, based on normal the behavior of most of the leaders of the world up to now, it's always resulted, almost always resulted in war. So he's giving us a warning, and it's a warning we're taking. Now, uh, the other thing that the, the <coughs> Allison pointed out is that uh, today, in terms of wealth, the United States is number one, United States, China is number two. But then when you look at GDP, in 2014, China's GDP had already exceeded that of the United States. A lot of people get excited about it. You know, you have to, when you look at GDP, you have to look at population. Chinese have four times our population, so until they get four times our value in GDP, things aren't balanced. Because our income, average income in the United States is $56,000. It's about 12 or 13 in China. So when you start comparing countries, you just can't look at the raw numbers and draw the conclusion that the Chinese are caught up with us. There are a lot of people, particularly in the, in the hinterlands, who are still relatively poor. Having said that, one of the, main, one of the things that point that uh, Graham also points out in his study is that 1978, Right after Mao died, 90% of the people in, in China were making $2 or less. That's called poverty, $2 a day or less. Today, and you stated 2017, 98% of people are no longer in poverty. You think about that. Over a billion people have gone from being poor to middle class. That's a lot of people. And if there's anything China wants to brag about, that's something that's happening That's happening there with their autocratic capitalism. Well, ourselves here, wealth is shrinking money for most people. And so we, there's something that we, when we start criticizing Chinese for their autocratic capitalism, 
while they have restricted rights and not been denied their people a lot of freedoms that we have here, the trade-off is people whose lives are so much better in China, and therefore Xi Jinping's control of China is very, very solid because everybody is, realizes what a better life to have now than 40 years ago. And we can't say that here. For the last 40 years, income has been like this. Our growth in the last 40 years is 0.2% a year in terms of average income. That's got to change. Because uh, when I retired, I always like to look. When I retired in 1994, I went to Safeway, slapped down the rock, and got four red delicious apples. I bought four red delicious apples the other day. It was eight dollars. In other words, since I retired, I got my retirement from the Air Force in 1994. The ability to buy apples, cost of apples, quintuple, from 25 cents to two dollars. That's really scary. The scary thing about the inflation. Now inflation. Everybody in, in the world is worried about inflation. Some other people whose opinions uh, can weigh into this uh, topic that they've called collision, clash of civilizations. We talked about Graham Allison, he talked about the fact that whenever you have these challenges, one and two, you get the end of the war. Well, John Mearsheim is another person that if you don't, are not familiar with, I recommend that you go to YouTube. And listen, he has got dozens of YouTube videos. And John is a real historian, and he points, he, he makes a great point that he studied, he compares America with China. He says, China is now the stage that we were in 150 years ago. When we were developing, America was extremely aggressive. A guy named Teddy Roosevelt, he implemented James, President Monroe's Monroe Doctrine, and he threw everybody in the Western Hemisphere back to Europe. That was very, very aggressive. In fact, we, went to, we almost went to war with, we put pressure on Colombia so that we could take over the Panama Canal and go to the Panama Canal, because that was considered very strategic. Before the Panama Canal, people, everything we had to do to go all the way around the south, so all Trans-Pacific traffic that went through a big, big hurdle. Once the canal was done, it saved a lot of time and money. Roosevelt saw that, and he used brute force to get to get control of the, the rebels in Panama and build the Panama Canal, and that changed world history. And the point of the airshine was why that China is going to a point now where it's going to be more aggressive than it was when it was weak. The main, the other point that the airshine makes is that uh, China rem remembers when it was weak. During the Hero War, at the beginning of the Hero War, 1839, when China was weak, everybody took advantage of it. Mearsheim's point is countries all over the world realize that when you are weak, you're not going to survive. And so, like the United States, China is emulating our goals to become the most powerful country it can be so it can't be attacked again. Does that make sense? By the way, as I mentioned, anytime you have questions, pop it up. Right now, the, the hottest point between the United States and China is our U U.S. Navy going into the South China Seas. And uh, Mearsheim reminds that during the Monroe Doctrine, any, any foreign country that went into the, if the European that going into their Caribbean, into our Caribbean, was thrown out. South China Seas is the Chinese Caribbean, right? Just the south, southern portion. Therefore, they are behaving very much like ourselves. However, our Navy, our Navy, our aggressive Navy activities has not been responded likewise with China. And uh, we'll, we'll get to look more into that a little bit later on. Just two weeks ago, Henry Kissinger made a remark that war warns of catastrophic conflicts and that's true. U.S. and China settled the differences. It would be worse than the world wars that ruined Europe civilization, says former Secretary of State. One side cannot dominate the other, and they have to get used to that, according to Kissinger. Kissinger and, and most of the scholars in this world realize that with the rising power of China, the United States has learned to, learn to accommodate. China is not going to go away, and therefore we have to figure out the best way to, 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 to live with her to our, to our benefit. You probably can't read that too well. One really unusual thing happened in July of last year. The Washington Post printed a two-page article titled, China is not our enemy. And the very usual thing about 90 of the top scholars and military officers in the country all signed a document 
stating this, the seven points you see up there. First, they stated that China's troubling behavior in recent years, including its turn toward domestic repression, increased state control over private firms, failure, failure to live up to several trade agreements, greater effects to control foreign opinion and more aggressive foreign policy, raises serious challenges to the rest of the world. These challenges require a firm and effective U.S. response, but the current approach to China is fundamentally counterproductive. He's talking about the current China policy in the state. Point two, we do not believe Beijing is an economic enemy or an existential national security threat that must be confronted in every sphere, nor is China a monolith or the views of its, or the views of its leaders set in stone. Three, U.S. efforts to treat China as an enemy and decouple it from the global economy would damage the United States' international role and reputation and undermine the economic interests of all nations. These are the comments signed by former secretaries of state, military officers, and business leaders. Point four, the fear that Beijing will replace the United States as a global leader is exaggerated. Most other countries have no interest in such an outcome and it is not clear that Beijing itself sees this goal as necessary or feasible. Five, although China has a goal of becoming a world-class military by mid-century, it faces immense hurdles to, op to operating a global dominant military power. However, Beijing's growing military capabilities have already eroded the United States' long-standing military preeminence in the Western Pacific. Are you also reading this? Does it make sense to you? A wiser policy is to work with allies to maintain deterrence, emphasize defensive oriented and area economic capabilities, resiliency, and the ability to frustrate attacks on US or allied territory. And uh, right there, striking really strongly at the, the current president's policy of breaking up our, our alliances and the importance of having alliances strong. Six, Beijing is seeking to weaken the role of Western democratic norms within the global order, but is not seeking to overturn vital economic and other components of that order from which China itself has benefited for decades. One thing that needs to be added is that one thing that China has never demonstrated is that our repeated attempts worldwide to overthrow regimes. And that's that, and the other thing is that Chinese are not messing up. They have not gone around trying to convert everybody to Buddhists. Dallas. That's those are things that we we're looking at tends to dampen up the, the fear that China, once it gets strong, is going around conquering the world, converting people to their autocratic system, and converting people to their religious practices. Having said that, most Chinese are not religious. They're, most of the, the, the things they practice are Confucian ethics, and that dominates more than religion in China. Lastly, in conclusion, a successful U.S. approach to China must focus on creating enduring global coalitions with other countries in support of economic and security objectives. It must be based on realistic appraisal of Chinese perceptions, interests, goals, and behavior, an accurate match of U.S. and allied resources with policy goals and interests, and a rededication of U.S. efforts to strengthen our own capacity to serve as a model for others. Yes, it's, uh, it's a chat. It's, as you can, the BRI, another exciting thing about BRI, we went to my that lecture, the Vector Project lecture, we mentioned that the thing that's funding most of, of the Silk Road projects is the Asian instrument, I, I, AIID. This is a Chinese concept, but it's like the UN. Everybody who joins in gets to participate, and the Chinese do not hold enough votes to control the AIB. Unlike the IMF and World Bank, where we control a lot of what those banks do, so with AIB, they not only have they, they, they don't have they have a more democratic way of dealing with funding infrastructure projects. They also get rid of the bureaucracy. With IMF and World Bank, it takes three to five years from the time that the project is introduced to, to become gets going. Three to five years because it's democracy. Everybody's been talking, talking about it. Three out of four people like it, the one quarter are dumping on it. Well, they saw that this is the problem. The, the, uh, Wang Lijin, who was president of AIB, used to work for World Bank, he saw that this was a major problem. As a result of that, he made sure that it does not happen. In, in the first year of uh, 
of AIB, and they funded more than a dozen infrastructure projects and got them going. So that's a lesson to us that uh, we need to get away from bureaucracy. Just like the reason we don't have infrastructure in America, part of it's money, part of it is there are a lot of too many people who have a voice in why a railroad road or a road can go somewhere with somebody, but somebody complains about the environment or something, and it slows things up. But the next thing that we had here was a partial listing of the people who, who signed that letter. And you note that uh, this is, a, this is only about a fifth of the, of the people who name one that you have. Jeff, Jeffrey Bader, Ian Bremer, Collins, Ambassador of Russia, Director of Kissinger Institute, Senior Fellow at Brookings, another Senior Brookings, Thomas Finger, the former uh, Deputy Director of National Intelligence. These are people who signed this document. That's why you, it's, you, can, you notice some of you, have, this document sounds pretty tough. It couldn't be a soft, if it were a soft, document, you would have had all these senior officials sign this document. I have a copy of it, so I want to look at it. It's five pages long. Okay, when we talk about collision of uh, civilizations, there are lots of reasons of things that, that, that probably is not going to be a war. And I'm going to sing out here. Reason why we not not likely to go to war. Xi Jinping and China do not want to go to war. It, it would disrupt their short-term, medium, and long-term plans. We know about the 2025 plan, the 2035 plan, and the 2049 plan. All these are for developing Chinese technologies and making Chinese stronger in every way. And by 2049, they hope to match our military capabilities. If China goes to war in the United States, all those plans will go to none because things, the world will change drastically. Now, we've heard of all the threats from America. One thing that we don't hear is that our generals know that America cannot go to another war. You probably know that we've been at war 19 years. In those 19 years, our military is totally exhausted. Our army has 56 regiments. Only three is ready to go to war, to another war. Three regiments is 45,000 people. You're going to go to war with China with 40,000. 5,000 army units. Our United States Air Force has 2,000 power pilots shortage. We have 17,000 mechanics shortage. So the Air Force is not ready for war either. The Navy is so tired that they're bumping in, they're allowing civilian ships to bump in four times as fast in two years. We allowed civilian surface ships to run into our Aegis destroyers. I built Aegis destroyers. We can detect submarines 100 miles away. How do we allow a surface ship, an oil tanker three times our size, to run into one of my Aegis destroyers? Fatigue. Our Navy had three collisions. Navy command blamed on training. That's a cover up for the word fatigue. When we go through Malacca Straits, we put three men on the surface of the ship. In addition to having all of our sensors and guys in the, in the bridge looking, we put person who stands in front of the ship and two point on each side in the direction we're heading to avoid bumping anybody right? because the Malacca Straits is very tight. So how in the world can an Aegis destroyer that can detect submarines 100 miles away, people in the bridge with binoculars, and three people standing in front of the ship to be rammed by an oil tanker three times in size? Fatigue. So our military is totally fatigued. We need at least 10 or 20 years to recuperate and recover, maybe and bring back the draft before we take on any major operation. So that's a major reason why all this tough talk is by people who don't really understand that our military does not need to get in any fight, especially the fight against four billion square mile China. Today, China has done very little aggressive and pushing for military action against the United States. We are the aggressors pushing the South China Sea where our national security is not involved. Nor are 5,000, 5 million sea transports that are doing trade every year. There, there is freedom of navigation, just that they don't want the U.S. Navy doing its military operations in South China Sea. Everybody else can go back and forth. Why would China disrupt the South China Sea? Two thirds of the, the boats going there are bringing oil to China and things in return. So the South China Sea is the very is the hottest spot for us because we are pushing it. Last week we had a fleet of ships. I don't know how many ships there were, but it was a huge fleet. 
escorting an uh, aircraft carrier. We even had a lot of two of the uh, U.S. Coast Guard ships that I see every day in Alameda there trying to must to show that we're strong, although nobody's really challenging us. The fact that they've, they've uh, built those, those, rebuilt those, uh, made islands out of those reefs is almost a waste of money because with sea, sea rise, they will all be underwater. We deny that. We, as Paul Merosheimer says, for the last hundred years, our U.S. Navy has gotten used to the freedom, of the freedom to wander. We can wander anywhere we want. Unfortunately, with now the China situation is, 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 has become stronger, we're not going to be able to do anything we want. In fact, we've been pushed back to the first island chain because of the missiles the Chinese have developed. Because the South China Sea, the Chinese are now developing special missiles to be aimed at our Navy ships that are going through the South China Seas. Again, it is a reaction to our offensive aggression that the Chinese are taking action. So we can't always blame the other side for that. Okay, I think I've mentioned it from there. The reason why we're not likely to go to war because we're, we do not have the capability to go to war. Our military is very tired. In the meantime, America and China must find reasons to cooperate in all circumstances where there is mutual benefit. We're talking about an alternative to aggressive actions. <coughs> Other things that we can co cooperate would be global counter climate change, which is the first step in teaching us that cooperation is, is useful and uh, mutual benefit. We can join China in countering international terrorism. That's a feasible step too. That's not hard to do. We need to cooperate to improve infrastructure throughout the Eastern Hemisphere, which will benefit. Well, I always talk about, mentioned about BRI, and how it can be very beneficial to anybody who participates. And we have many, many companies in America who are dying to participate in BRI. You talk about millions of contracts throughout the Eastern Hemisphere. The Chinese offer to cooperate with 5G and 6G communications. We figure it's a, we think it's a national security threat, so we're backing off of it. <coughs> One thing we ignore that already 54 countries in the world, including many in Europe, are already connected with 5G. They are so far, far ahead of us, not necessarily in technology, but in installations of 5G technology, that uh, it would be very beneficial for us to cooperate with them and, and get involved in a lot of these networks in the rest of the world that has been. All of Africa is with 5G, most of Europe is with 5G. And this is all, all Huawei stuff. South America is getting heavily covered by 5G from China. So it would be really wise of us to take advantage of that and the Chinese and invite us to, to work with the connections. Cooperation biochemical research. Probably some of you know, every major biochemical firm from Roche to Genentech has research firms in China. Reason? The Chinese government supports bio-research. They put billions of dollars into it. They realize it's their best interest. It's also interest to make them more powerful as a nation to have, to, to have uh, provide uh, the most advanced biotech. Like I said, every, every major biotech firm has research offices in China. I predict that almost all future biotech technical developments will come from China because the Chinese have a lot of people dedicated to it. The government supports it and they have every major Western biomedical research firm is also doing it there because they get tax benefits and a lot of other benefits because this is part of the Chinese strategic plan. So it would be very wise for us to get involved. I'm sure you've probably heard about the, uh, the, uh, the Chinese uh, researcher in, in, in Texas who was badgered because she was that she went to China, gave some lectures there, and she's the, one of the top cancer research doctors in, in, in our country, and we put so much pressure on her, she went back to China. Just what kind, what kind of threat to national security is a, is a, a even the Chinese, even if she's working partially for, for China, she's working on cancer research. She wasn't planning to leave America, she was, just happened to be at the University of Texas. And because she went to China, they paid her for doing some research there, she came back home, the FBI got on her, and she left. That FBI attack on scientists, uh, Chinese scientists, goes back to, to I think, 2009. What do we hope? 
And unfortunately, the thing is, even uh, Professor Xi, the FBI gets involved with these investigations. Sometimes their agents don't understand technology. For example, Professor Xi in Princeton lost his job because he gave the technology for hand warmers to China. Hand warmers. Because they misread the technology. One Ho Lee was charged with many, many charges, charged with 54 counts of espionage, and only one was ever held up. And that's for downloading stuff from the mainframe to his PC. The judge in that case apologized to Wen Ho Lee on behalf of the federal, federal government to be more aggressive. And we don't hear much about it. That was a long, long battle. Right? That was a long battle. And the FBI agents, what FBI agent even perjured himself by by claiming that the uh, that Wen Ho Lee uh, needed to be constrained with irons in the, inside the jail. So they, they, they wanted him to confess. When he wouldn't confess, this kind of pressure was put on him. So this is unfortunate. But Chinese American scientists need to be handled very, very carefully. One third of our national laboratory scientists are Chinese Americans. At NASA, it's about 20%. 15%, it's not one third. Fifteen percent of all our national lab, laboratory scientists are Chinese Americans, and NASA is 20%. These, uh, these people are doing really important work. What happens is sometimes somebody gets a big idea, and guess who, who pounds it up and makes, makes sure that the thing works? It's the Chinese scientists. Yes, sir. Uh, Roger, I agree that it's very unlikely that the United States and China would just get in a war together. But, you know, from a historical perspective, look at World War I. It was started by one guy getting shot, the Archduke. If for some reason we decide we want to invade North Korea and they decide they want to use some nuclear weapons against our bases, you know, the whole world, or if Pakistan should have been attacked. Graham Allison warns about that. He says the biggest risk is in the South China Seas. We have military ships there. Hopefully they're all under control and nobody. No one ship decides to, to start something, and that, that could cause the same type of phenomenon as World War I. Now, Korea, Korea is a really interesting in, incident. I, if I could be, if I had to solve the Korean problem, I would, because the first thing you had to realize about Um uh, is that he's like every other leader of the world. He wants to make his country great. His father and grandfather failed. So the only way to get to Um is to help him make his country great economically. This is a deal that he will sign. He may not sign it first, but he understands that he has a chance with Russian, Chinese, Japanese, American, and South Korean assistance. To North Korea can turn out to be turn out to be quite a nice nation. Right now, they're short of everything, and therefore, anything you give them, we could just offer them fertilizer, and that would be a very great incentive to for whom. The other thing that's, uh, that's very seldom mentioned about Um is that the only reason he makes weapons is to get our attention. He is, we have allowed him to steal our war plans. He knows that in one week, to, between South Korea and ourselves, we'd wipe them out. And if it was just South Korea, it would take him two weeks. So this is a no-win situation. The only reason he has weapons is to get our attention. Now he's got our attention. The thing to do is, if the deal is that we would gradually reduce our forces in South Korea, maybe 100, and then we'd send him fertilizer, GM could open the machine plant there. He is asking for help, and nobody seems to understand that's the only way to get to him. <coughs> yes, sir. I'm not sure how much China is involved in North Korea. I know a lot, but um, why are they doing more in development of industrial base and they don't want the competition, they don't want to lose the jobs? North Korea, you mean? Yeah, China's hesitation to develop in a way that you're suggesting. They have, they have, you look, have you seen a picture of Seoul recently? It looks like a mini, not Seoul, but Pyongyang, Pyongyang. Parts of it looks a little bit like a very modern city. That's right. because the Chinese have done that. Overall, North Korea is on its back. But the, the UM can claim that little thing, but that's just a very, very small portion. If UM wants to make Korea great, the best thing he can do is sign a peace treaty with this, which is a simple thing to do. And we can then start sending in fertilizer and all that. Half, you know, half the people are starving there. He could be a real hero if he just fed his people. And feeding people was not a hard thing to do. Uh, Jim Rogers, the, the, the billionaire, uh, in, uh, 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 billionaire, uh, sorry, 
investor visited Korea several times in the last couple of years. He loved to go there to make money because they, they have nothing in Korea, North Korea. So it's a great business opportunity for lots of people too. Yes, sir. See, my understanding is that our country is centered in Chinese entities and Chinese companies and persons who's aiding North Korea. And that's why China is very hesitant in, in helping North Korea. Because of what? The, our country is sanctioning Chinese companies oh, and individuals who is doing business with North Korea. Oh. That's, the that's our feeble attempts to do that because the, the, North, the North Koreans are surviving. And if you want to stop it, it's to change. Give them positive incentive. This is still Neanderthal. Neanderthal, let's go pound them, pound them. Huh? Nobody's going to want to do that because it would be catastrophic. Every defense secretary would say that a war with North Korea would be catastrophic for North Korea and change a lot of other things. We've, we, if you realize that what you need is positive incentive for Um, Um would love to be, he would like to be a hero, make him a hero, but once he do, does that, no more military stuff. That's, that would be the deal. Right now he's launching all these rockets. They don't scare me. There's no more warheads on them. In September 2015, a news story was, was broke out that nobody seemed to pay attention to. The Chinese, who had been monitoring the North Korean H-bomb testing, told us that they had a disaster on their, their, their sixth site. That disaster was so bad that most likely they lost a lot or all of their testing equipment and a lot of top scientists. After that, Guess who comes to start talking, talk, walking? It's so obvious that he did that because he had no other choice. He's tested some rockets, but they're not a threat to anybody without warheads. So the thing is, for, to, to deal with North Korea, you need to deal with positive incentive. Offer him an, a top opportunity to make, defeat his people, polish up the cities, we'll open GM plants there, Toyota will go there and put on the Toyota plants. In 30 years, 20, 30 years, they'll be a little soul, still a little soul. They can't go catch up with soul. Soul is so, such a powerful and, and effective uh, modern city. But uh, that is the way to deal with Moon. I wrote that letter to, uh, who was the last National Security Department, yeah, Marine General? Not Matt, Matt's what you said. Oh, Matt. Jim Matt. Jim. Jim Matt is the Secretary of Defense. Yes. yes but the, we know who it is. The two M and the M's, and they don't stay long enough at the White House for us to learn their names. <laughs> but I did write a letter, and uh, I don't know. I guess it's pretty difficult for a Marine Corps general to come, to come up with non military solutions. Because that's what it is. The way you deal with North Korea is a non military solution. Because all their military stuff is BS. Once they shoot one rocket off to us, South Korean Air Force has 800 modern fighter jets. North Korea has 100 old Soviet things. Just the South Korean Air Force can wipe it off. Plus, they have 600,000 black belt guys, right? <laughs> they can do some damage too, but it's just the military equipment that they have is overwhelming. North Korea, unless the only thing that the North Koreans have over us, they got 10,000 artillery pieces in the DMZ or near the DMZ. If they start to start a war, they could virtually wipe out Seoul and kill a lot of people. But that would be the end of them too. But that's a great ace to have for us because if they really wanted to, if they wanted to shoot artillery, you wouldn't have time to get to put guys on the airplanes. The artillery would be wiping out, including Camp uh, Camp Campbell, Camp, Camp, Camp Humphreys, where we have a lot of our. We just moved that south. Yeah, we moved that south. That's true. They can't hit us with artillery there. So we got off track. Sorry, we keep doing that. Almost done here. Good news and bad news. <coughs> well, we'll talk about all the problems we've had with China because when, when, we, when trading started again start 30, 30 years ago for earnest, American and Western businesses saw that, hey, I, in China, labor is $2 to $3 an hour, and I'm paying my people $15 to $20 an hour. Good idea. Why don't I go to China? I make all kinds of money, and they did. There have been hundreds of millionaires made in America going to China by moving, transferring the jobs. No jobs are ever stolen from by the Chinese. Not a single one. There's no document, one document example where Chinese have stolen jobs. 
the jobs were lost, were transferred because astute businessmen saw that it was a great benefit to reduce their labor costs. Not only that, once you move most of your workers overseas, you don't need the HR department, you don't need health care, you don't need all kinds of other expenses. You can sell the land that the factories on. There's a lot of money to be made by shipping money overseas, and then you, the money you make is all yours. Also, if there's strikes or anything there, it's, it's a Chinese problem. It's not your problem. Maternity leave, not my problem. It's a Chinese problem. So the decision to move two and a half million jobs overseas between 2001 and 2016 was simply a very wise business decision made by not just American but Western businessmen who wanted to make more money. And we, uh, a lot of people are mad at uh, uh, all these job losses. Another thing that hasn't been told is that when we, when we receive all these guys told you about the $540 billion worth of goods that come in last year, guess what happens when one of these great super raiders comes in? There's 14,000 containers on them. The maximum capacity is 20, but the, on the average, 14,000. Each of these containers have to be unloaded from the ships and placed strategically throughout the, 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 the harbor so that when trucks come in, they can go and get, their, get what they need to get without having to search through the whole database. So it takes a lot of programmers, a lot of people moving pieces, these containers off the ships to get ready for truckers. Three and a half million truckers are going to all these ports to pick up all this stuff. These are millions of jobs that did not exist before the China trade. These jobs are more than double, and, and not on top of that, once it, the trucks pick up, they bring it to a warehouse, a central warehouse, a regional warehouse, where thousands of other people have to break open the containers. This one goes to Walmart, this one goes to the Macy's. So they all have to be sorted. It takes thousands of people to do that. Then when it actually gets to Walmart, Walmart breaks the, the, the cartons down to individual pieces, prices them, puts them on shelves, somebody has to sell them. These are all jobs that would not exist if it weren't for the huge, huge China trade. The number of pieces of things, they talk about 540 billion dollars. There are trillions of pieces of things that have to be sorted and sold. And all those people work and they pay taxes. That is money attributed directly from China trade. You're talking about billions of dollars that we know we talk about. Even UPS and FedEx, the drivers, they don't not even need the carriage made in China. But they have a lot of overtime now because there's so many pieces in the <coughs> because things are broken down. Guess what? On Sunday, the postal service works now. Yeah. Why are they doing it? All the trade, all the online trading. Then that's not all China, but a lot of it is China. So we do not even acknowledge that millions of jobs have been created because of this huge China trade. Unfortunately, the people who lost the jobs. The low tech, low tech people who work in the in, in uh, mines, etc., their jobs are gone forever. But these new jobs, more to cover, and more and the taxes paid for those things are, are very, very high, hard to calculate because in most cases these are part-time salaries because nobody works 108 hours a day doing Chinese stuff. If you go to Walmart, most of their stuff is Costco. Most of them will be in China, except for booze and other things like that. So that's one thing that uh, when you start getting mad at China, you get mad at China for the right reasons. There are many jobs now that exist that did not exist and would go away if those $540 billion worth of goods weren't coming in there and unloaded everywhere. So what else is good about this China trade that we don't talk about? Citizens, average citizen saves $800 to $1,000 a year shopping at Walmart, Costco, etc. Myself, last year I bought a blazer, a cashmere blazer, uh, Costco, ninety dollars. It would cost me five hundred at the bank at uh, men's, not men's, well, uh, any, any major haberdashery. A cashmere blazer would cost you five hundred dollars. I paid ninety dollars for it at Costco. I didn't intend to buy it, but when I saw it, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, with automation. The wage gap is going to go away. Jobs will no longer be outsourced because all those jobs will be gone forever. It is predicted by McKinsey that by 2030, hopefully most of us will be still alive in 2030, that's only 11 years from now, 75 million jobs will disappear from America. That's crisis. If you have 75 million people suddenly have no, 
no paychecks. Most of these people are not going to be transferred to other jobs, other than low, other more low, lower paying jobs. Not many of them are job of programmers. So this really is a bigger threat to us. Even. Over the world, they can predict 400 million jobs probably will be lost globally because of automation. One story I always like to tell is that on the one week after our current president was elected president, he did a, he did a great deed. He heard that AC, car AC carrier, the people making air conditioners, were going to move the plant to Mexico. And so our boss said, don't do that. We've got to save those jobs. Please don't do that. So the AC carrier boss said, okay, boss, we won't move to, we won't move to Mexico. We will do our plant, and then we'll keep all the jobs here. Unfortunately, a year later, when the plant was completed, only 10% of the jobs were, were uh, replaced by people. The other percent were done by <laughs> Already, automation affected us that early. Looking forward, it's going to be you. We don't, whoever wants to keep America great, better deal with how we're going to handle all the people out of work. And all those seniors who are going to need money. Seniors. Because things keep on getting expensive. And uh, I have enough money today to pay for my food. Ten years from now, if I live another ten years, that apple is going to cost ten dollars each. That I paid two dollars for. Anyway, the economy is really important for us to work on. It is truly one of the challenges of the century for America. We should not misdirect our challenges as China. We must find answers to many millions of Americans who will be either jobless or many without new jobs, likely earning less. And this is what we're talking about ten years from now. We're not talking about our grandchildren. That's our abrupt ending. I'm sorry if we don't have great news, but I think it's my job to be warned. People will get mad at me and say I'm being unpatriotic by telling these stories. I think it's very unpatriotic to not tell people about this, because we better be ready for it. Some of us are old enough where it won't hit us through bad, but our children and grandchildren are going to be affected by automation.